Shalom, I am Rabbi Michael Panitz of Temple Israel of Norfolk, Virginia, speaking to you from the pulpit of my congregation. And with this message, we begin a new season of weekly messages based on the Torah, based on our sacred scriptures. Today's message is known, Owning Up to Losses. 30 years ago, the end of July, 1992, I preached my first sermon at Temple Israel. The Torah portion at that time was the same as the current one. Then as now, I was drawn to the story told in the book of Numbers, chapter 32, of the two tribes of Israel who traded their promised inheritance on the west bank of the Jordan River for the territory of the Golan and the east Jordanian side of the river. Now as then, I see the story as a testimonial to the growing maturity of the Israelites. Instead of just complaining of alternately idolizing and reviling Moses, of indulging in idle wish fantasies, those Israelites made a reasoned presentation of their needs, heard the objections posed by Moses, and met those objections with a generous counter offer. Here's the story. The tribes of Reuven and Gad were cattle breeders. The Golan country is good for cattle. Having unexpectedly come into possession of that country, when the Israelites fought off the attacks of Sihon and Og, kings of the Amorites and of the Bashan, the two tribes wanted to settle there instead of on the west bank of the Jordan River. Moses responded to their request angrily. He thought that they were repeating the historic mistake of the previous generation and refusing to fulfill their destiny of returning to the promised land of Israel. But they assured Moses that they supported the national project of settling the land of Israel. They themselves would fight in the vanguard on behalf of their brother tribes. They would stay in the field until all their kinfolk had been successfully settled and only then return to their chosen territory. Moses accepted their proposal, although with a certain amount of ungraciousness. Later on, the successor to Moses, Joshua, acknowledged that the two and a half tribes, by then they had been joined by half the clans of the tribe of Menashe, had indeed fulfilled their promise. And you can read that in the book of Joshua, chapter 22. 30 years ago, I understood the Bible story to be telling us that we need to listen to each other. We need to know how to compromise. We need to know how to see ourselves as part of a greater whole. In short, there's a time to stop being a partisan and to be a patriot, focused on the big picture, not on one's own narrow gains. I still think that it's true. But on this year's rereading, another detail of the story strikes me as timely. This added dimension of the biblical message complements the general lesson that I preached in my inaugural sermon at Temple Israel. The first of the cities mentioned by the chieftains of Reuven and Gad in their petition to Moses was Atarot. As it happens, that is one of the places mentioned in the Mesha Stele, also known as the Moabite stone. That stone was an inscription discovered by archeologists in the mid 19th century, exploring in what is now Jordan. Once deciphered, the text was electrifying. It was essentially the same story as that preserved in the Bible, 2 Kings chapter three, 
about the Moabite campaign for independence from Israelite rule. A little history here. King David had extended Judean rule over Moab. After the division of the Jewish kingdom into two states, Judah and Israel, it was the northern kingdom of Israel that controlled Moab. Some decades later, the Moabites under their king Mesha rebelled against Israelite rule. The Bible tells a strange story about the combined armies of Judah and Israel attacking Moab to remain in control over it, but failing at the decisive moment when they were besieging the capital city. The story ends with the biblical summary statement, quote, there came great wrath upon Israel and they departed from Moab and returned to their own land. Second Kings chapter three, verse 27. The Mesha Stili presents the same story from the Moabite point of view. Although there are some discrepancies, it too tells much of the story of the successful Moabite campaign for independence. It specifies that the Moabites recaptured the city of Atarot and massacred the Israelite inhabitants of that city to satisfy the bloodlust of their god, Chemosh. For our people, certainly this was an unhappy ending to the story that began in Numbers 32 with the ranchers of Ruvain and Gad looking at their newly gained grasslands and reckoning their good fortune. But here's the point that is so relevant for us today. Notice that the Bible does not shrink from telling the truth about our nation's defeats and losses, not only its victories and gains. Turns out that the truthful acknowledgement of loss was in short supply in the ancient world. And it is again in short supply today. The ancient Egyptian inscriptions are all about the victories of the pharaohs. Their losses somehow never made it into the news. And so is it in our world. You will look in vain in the Russian press for accurate reporting about the massive casualties within the Russian ranks that Putin's invasion has caused. Closer to home, the Congressional January 6th Committee has just concluded its work. It is dismaying to realize that the entire explosion began with the president defeated in the polls by a margin in the millions of votes, simply unable to accept that he had lost. His situation is pathological, but the social pathology of those willing to assault our bastion of democracy is a scary force multiplier to the individual pathology. It shows that our democracy is indeed on a fragile foundation with a betrayal of civilized self-restraint made alarmingly popular. I remember the 1960s Gene Raskin song, Those Were the Days, My Friend, made famous in Mary Hopkins' recording. Maybe you remember these lyrics. We'd live the life we choose, we'd fight and never lose, for we were young and sure to have our way. It is time for our citizenry to put away the immature illusions that were at the heart of the assault upon our democracy. In the real world, you do not fight and never lose. Sometimes you win, and sometimes you lose. The Bible knows that. It tells us that instead of replacing reality with a fantasy world of resentment, blame, and ultimately aggression, 
We need to learn from our losses. The biblical Book of Kings was written in exile. The priests who edited it understood that the centuries long experiment of kingship had been a failure in ancient Israel because we had lost sight of the values that are expressed poetically in the metaphor, God is our king. Those priests and authors understood that God's teachings had been right for us, they were still right for us, and that by returning to them, we could yet hope for regeneration. That is my prayer for my fellow Americans. Understand that the blessings of democracy require maturity and civic virtue. Understand that your favored candidate may win or lose, but that if democracy loses, we all lose. 30 years ago, I saw the Bible story as a useful lesson. Today, I see it as an urgent wake up call. May we hear the summons and heal the wounds in our body politic. Amen.